Good morning. Man, we are so glad you're here this morning. We are going to welcome you and uh, let you know that. It's good to have you with us here. That's true whether you're with us in the room or if you're joining us online. We are glad that you are here and uh, we can't wait to see what we've got today, what our God wants to say to us uh, through our worship through our time in his word. Uh, so let's just bow together and we will start this thing off. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, God. We just thank you for the privilege we have to come and to gather in your name. God, we thank you for the privilege we have to be called your children. God, we so don't deserve it. And we thank you for the fact that we can know you, God, that we can know your grace and your salvation. We just pray that you would be with us today as we worship. God, help us to uh, simply be reminded of that, God, of, uh, of all that you are in our lives. God, remind us of your greatness and the fact that you are worthy of our praises. Uh, we just pray that you would speak to hearts today here. God, we love you and we are here for you. Uh, just be with us right now. God, bless our time here together. God, let us, let us know for a fact when we leave this place that we have been in your presence. God, we love you, and we pray it in your name. Amen. Well, let's lift our voices together. We're going to praise our God as we always do. We are here today for that reason, to lift up his name, to sing his praises, to worship him. Let's bring ourselves right now before the feet of the God of this universe. And let's just bow humbly before him and praise his name. One, two, three. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Praise 
is hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in the storm, in the storm. shake at the sound of just one name over all Jesus reigns I know I know nations bow and mountains shake at the sound of just one name for all Jesus reigns, I know. One who saves. I love that song because it's got several things in there that it says that remind us of who God is, the fact that he is in charge, the fact that he knows what's going on in your life and mine. He is the king of glory. He is the one who saves, and we are here to worship him. Sunset. 
never forget that. I'm a child of God. And if that is true in my life, no one and nothing can tell me otherwise. Um, because if God claims me as his child, nobody can take that away from me. And that's something to remember. All throughout my history, Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every 
every season from where I'm standing. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises and fulfillment all over my life. to victory You are my strength and you always will be I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over my life I see your promises and fulfillment The atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Sing it with me the atmosphere is changing now For the Spirit of the Lord is here The evidence is all around That the Spirit of the Lord is here Overflow in this place Fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter.
atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the lord is here the atmosphere is changing now for the spirit of the lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of the lord is here
the evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here a miracle can happen now for the spirit of the Lord is here the dance is all around that the spirit of the Lord is Father, let that be true right here and right now, God. Let us know that we are in the presence of the Lord. God, let us be tuned into you, God, in a way that makes it possible for you to do miracles here in this place. God, for you to change lives here in this place. It's why we are here today. God, speak to us now. God, we pray that in your name, amen. Amen. Good morning to you. You may be seated. Welcome to those who are watching online. Welcome to those in the room. We are honored to have you. It's a privilege to worship the Lord Jesus with you together. We are continuing to pray for what's going on around our world. We gave you a briefing a couple of Wednesdays ago. The situation continues to be very, very tragic in Ukraine and in other places around the world. So we're continuing to pray for the leaders there. We're continuing to pray for the leaders of our country to make wise and correct and bold and courageous decisions. We want to pray for you as well if there are struggles in your life or spiritual situations and questions that you have. If you received a worship guide when you came in the room today, there is a tear-off section where you can write a prayer request or our email address for those in the room and online, prayer at firstmelissa.com, prayer at firstmelissa.com. On the other side is a section, if you're in the room and you are a guest with us and we haven't had a chance to say hello to you personally, that's what this information slip is for. We'd love to welcome you to our church. You can drop that in one of the offering boxes if you'd like. We have a lot of things happening, our regular ministries, plus a lot of exciting new things that are happening this Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. We will gather together each week. We study the weekly Torah portion at Torah Tuesday Tuesday mornings, 7 a.m. Wednesday evening, we have a dinner at 5.30. We have a worship service in this room at 6.30 p.m. Inside the worship guide, you'll see that we have things happening for our senior adult ministry as well. We have some special guests coming from Israel, personal friends of mine. Elliot Chodoff will be here on March 23. Sandra Barris will be here on March 27. Would love for you to be a part of that. We have a Passover demonstration meal that we're going to have on April the 14th. You need a ticket for that. And we are going to take the proceeds from that event and share them with our missions partners in Romania. You should know that this week we were able, because of the generosity of the people in this church, to send an extra gift to our mission partners in Romania because they are now ministering to refugees from Ukraine who have crossed the border into Romania. And so we are able to send that money because of the generosity of our congregation. This event that many people will want to be a part of to learn about the Passover meal will help us to do that as well. So that's coming up on April the 14th. There's a website where you can reserve your spot for that. All of the things that we do in ministry, we do together when we give and when we serve and when we volunteer and when we pray together. I mentioned the offering boxes are back here in this room, also in the foyer. That's one way to give of your tithes and offerings. Our online options, you have the church's smartphone app. We have Venmo app. You have firstmelissa.com slash give for electronic giving. Lots of ways to give your tithes and offerings to God's kingdom work here. But it literally is making a difference around the world as we continue to give and be generous together. So thank you for that. And this morning we're going to continue the teaching series that we've titled Resolved. 
We are studying the book of Daniel, and we have taken a verse from Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It said, Daniel resolved. Daniel made up his mind not to defile himself. Daniel decided in his heart that he would do what is right because it was right. In Hebrew, Yasem Daniel Alibo. Daniel made a decision. Sometimes the English says he made up his mind, but the word literally is he made up his heart. He determined in his heart to do what is right, to do what is good, to do what is godly. We've studied chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Daniel. So today we are going to pick up in Daniel chapter 4. The king is still Nebuchadnezzar. But you need to know as we start Daniel chapter 4 that we have skipped a lot of time since Daniel chapter 3. About 30 years have gone by since the end of chapter 3. Remember we talked about those three gentlemen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, standing for righteousness and enduring the punishment of being thrown into the fiery furnace. Well, we've jumped ahead about 30 years in time. The year now is about 570 A.D. This is about year number 35 of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He will reign for a total of 43 years. And this seems to be year number 35. So he is an older man. And a lot of Daniel chapter 4 is in the words of the king himself. It's like a diary of King Nebuchadnezzar as he looks back on his life. So let's read together Daniel chapter 4. I hope you have it in your own Bible or look on the screens with us. Daniel chapter 4 verse 1. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth. He's giving an official proclamation now. He's looking back on his own life, but this is not a personal statement. This is an official statement to all the people in the kingdom. He begins by saying, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the most high God has done for me. Remember, this is a man who took captive Daniel and the other Jews made them omit their Hebrew past. And yet here's a man now, 35 years later, who's coming to acknowledge who the one true God is, the God of Israel. And he says, it seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom, God's kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion, that means his rule, his control, is from generation to generation. This is a man who struggled with his own pride, and he's going to talk about that. This is a man who refused to believe that the God of Israel was the one true God, and yet his heart has been changed. Verse 4, as he looks back in time, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. You've obviously seen a pattern here. This is how God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar through dreams. And sometimes he's able to interpret them himself and sometimes he needs advisors to do that. And so now near the end of his life, he's looking backwards and he said, I had another dream and this one was troubling to me. It made me fearful. Verse 6, so I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, remember all of the advisors that he would have, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, and they could not make its interpretation known to me. We're reading chapter 4. Remember back in chapter 2, the terms were different. He said, you tell me what my dream is, then you interpret my dream. This time he doesn't make them figure out the dream. He just tells them what it is. And we'll learn it in just a moment. And then he said, tell me what this means. He's learning that God speaks to him in a dream. That God has a message for him and he wants to know what to do with that. So he shares the dream 
But it says, no one could make the interpretation known to me. So what does he always do? He turns to our friend Daniel. We told you this is about 30 years past the end of chapter 3. When Daniel was taken captive and moved from Judah to Babylon, he was a teenager, 16, 17, 18 years old. So we think Daniel is now about 50 years old or in his early 50s. He's been serving the king as an advisor for decades. They have a long relationship. And for all of these 30-something years, Daniel has shown himself to be a man of God, resolved, a man of godliness, a man of wisdom, a man of truth, a man of honesty, a man of courage. And so 35 years into this relationship, Nebuchadnezzar still turns to the others, the pagans, and they still fail him. And he still turns to Daniel, and that's what happens in verse 8. Finally, remember this is the king looking backwards. Finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name, his renamed Babylonian name, is Belteshazzar. Bel is one of the Babylonian gods. He was renamed after one of those gods. Finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar says, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Now, this does not mean that Daniel slash Belteshazzar is engaging in the witchcraft and the sorcery of the pagans. Doesn't mean that. Nebuchadnezzar lumps all of his advisors together in this title. Conjurers, diviners, magicians. He has this title. And Daniel's the chief. He's the boss of that group. But Daniel is also known to be a worshiper and devoted to the one true God, the God of Israel. And maybe Nebuchadnezzar was hoping to avoid what God was going to do in his heart. Finally, he calls Daniel in. He says, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, Tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. Daniel, I need your help. Remember, 30-something years he's been serving the king. I want to show you Philippians chapter 2. When we talk about the character of Daniel, look at this. uh, This is Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. We're studying Daniel and we want to know the story of Daniel as a history lesson. Because it's important. But we need to know the story of Daniel as it relates to us in this culture. And I think it's fair to say we now live in a crooked and perverse generation. And we need to know how to be the light of God in the middle of that. Just like Daniel was trying to be. Children of God. So there's a, an identification we have with the one true God. Children of God above reproach. Meaning if they brought an accusation against you, nobody would even believe it. Because it's so far from your character. Above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. This is Philippians. But this is the kind of character that Daniel had. And this is why the king keeps coming back to him. And he says to help me with my dream. So we'll continue. Daniel 4. Now we're at verse 10. The king still speaking. Remember most of this chapter are his words. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking And behold, there was a tree. Previous dream was about a statue. This is a tree in the midst of the earth. And its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong. Its height reached to the sky. It was visible to the whole earth. We're going to learn about a global empire. That's what this is about. 
He said about the tree, its foliage was beautiful, its fruit was abundant, and it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all living creatures fed themselves from it. Here's the dream. Big, huge tree, it's covering the whole earth. And everybody can fall underneath it, in the shade and in the fruit, to be fed by it. But, verse 13, I was looking in the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted and spoke as follows, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, scatter its fruit, let the beasts flee from under it, and the birds from under its branches. Yet, verse 15, leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. So see the vision? Huge tree. But chop it down, cut off all the branches, take away all the fruit. Don't pull it out, don't uproot it. And then put a metal band around it. And then it says, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Now we, we went from it to him. We went from a tree, an object, to him, a person. And maybe you know the interpretation that's coming. Verse 16, let his mind See, we're talking about a person now. This is still the dream. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let a beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods, most people interpret that to be seven years of time pass over him. This sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers. So this is a spiritual situation. And the decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it power, rulership, bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowliest of men. Now, in some ways, we need to be a little bit compassionate for Nebuchadnezzar because this man wavers so much in his faith. We've called it in this series, the spiritual roller coaster. Some days he acknowledges that there is one God and he is the God of Israel. And then sometimes he acknowledges his pagan idols that fail him every single time. Remember back in Daniel chapter two, verse 47, the king said to Daniel, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings. And then in chapter 3, he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you, have, you are blessed, and blessed be your God who sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him. So there are times when he acknowledges the power of the one true God. And yet he continues in the wavering, in the roller coaster. And you say, why haven't you learned? So he relates this dream to Daniel and he says, I need your help. Verse 18, this is the dream which I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, right? <laughs> Tell me its interpretation. Inasmuch as none of the wise men of my kingdom is able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able for a spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar, or Daniel, replied, my lord, if only the dream, my boss, that means, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversary. 
Now remember, all the pagan worshipers, all the magicians and sorcerers were unable to interpret the dream. But maybe they could interpret it. They just didn't want to say it to the king. You know that cliche now, speak truth to power. Every politician promises it before they're elected. To speak truth to power. Maybe they didn't want to do that. Because see, part of godliness is courage. And Daniel had both. And he knows what the dream is about. Maybe you can already interpret the dream. He knows what it's about. And so he says, King, you're my boss. I've worked for you for 30 years. I, for your sake, wish that this was applicable to your enemies. But this is applicable to you. So look at verse 20 now, Daniel 4. The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, whose foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and has reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, that's his term, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it. He's quoting the king. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, 24, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, my boss. That you, king, this is called the speak truth to power section right here. That you be driven away from mankind from your palace, from your family. And your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field. And you be given grass to eat like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time, again, most people interpret it to be seven years, will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. See, king, you were the tree. You covered the whole earth. Everything was underneath you. And you had a dream that that big, beautiful, domineering tree was about to be cut off. Guess what, king? That's you. Remember, though, there was a specific part of this dream, verse 26. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Remember, we're not uprooting the tree. We're chopping it off so that the stump is still there. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sin. Or what we would call, it's time to repent. See, there's a warning being given. But guess what? God's going to show patience. This is not, uh oh, king, this is happening tonight. In fact, I'll show you how long it will be in a minute. This is a warning. Just like some of us need a warning or have needed a warning, you are on the wrong path. You have chances, you have time to turn this thing around. But if you stay on this path, there's defeat, there's destruction, there's sorrow, there's pain at the end of this path. Stop now, is Daniel's statement. Repent. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness 
and from your iniquities, that's sinfulness, by showing mercy to the poor. These would be acts that honor God. In case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. Daniel says, I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know how much time you have. I think God's giving you some time. I don't know how long. He's giving you some time. It is, it is the important decision you must make now to turn this around. Now, remember the setting, please. The king is giving you a, a, a remembrance of his past through an official proclamation. So he's looking backwards in time. This is happening for us, but it's all past tense for him. And guess what? Next verse 28. The king says, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later... He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So I told you that the king was given some time to repent. This wasn't a day or a week. This was a year. Twelve months to get the wake-up call. And the king is now looking backwards and saying, I was still in charge. I still ruled over my empire. And I was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Notice 12 months to repent. And we could do a whole study on the patience of God. Proverbs 28 verse 13. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Acts 3 verse 19. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The whole story of Jonah is about Jonah didn't want to go preach salvation to the Ninevites, these people he hated, because he knew God would be merciful and forgive them of their sins if they repented. In our lives, God often is gracious enough and patient enough to say, here's your warning, will you listen? Now, he's perfectly justified to bring the hammer when he needs to bring the hammer because we broke his law. We violated the commandments of God. We deserve punishment. Actually, we deserve immediate punishment. But in his mercy, he refrains from that. For 12 months in this case. Yet no repentance on Nebuchadnezzar's so he says, I'm walking around on the palace, looking at the beauty of my kingdom. Verse 30, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? This is the king bragging about himself. You've heard the phrase, you're full of yourself. This is the ultimate example of that. You know what Proverbs 16 verse 5 says? Everyone who is proud in his heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, he will also reap. He's looking at the kingdom and he says, look what I've done. Look how impressive I am. Was he a successful guy? Sure. Maybe you've heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world. One of them is called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. We have a painting for you here. I'll tell you about it. Babylon is modern day Iraq. It's flat and mainly desert. But Nebuchadnezzar had a wife named Amitis, and she missed the green and the mountains from her homeland. So he recreated a man-made green mountain for his wife in the desert. The city of Babylon was 
the most magnificent city on the earth, probably the biggest city on the earth. We'll go to another painting of the hanging gardens to show you what authors or uh, artists think it looked like. The city had a double wall system. The inner wall was 21 feet thick. The outer wall was 11 feet thick. He had a, another wall on the other side of the Euphrates River, huge river that he built a bridge across, 400 foot long bridge. The wall was wide enough that chariots could drive on top of the wall. 53 different temples were said to be built within Babylon. Three different palaces. One of them included this famous hanging gardens. You had to figure out 2,600 years ago the engineering to draw water out of the Euphrates River on a pulley system and deliver it to the top of your man-made mountain to water all these plants. The genius was incredible. And he did it, and he was so proud of himself. And yet, he was told to repent. He was warned. And for 12 months, he did not listen. So while he is standing on the roof of his palace, looking at the majesty of his creation, as he is speaking these words, look verse 31 of Daniel 4, while the word was in the king's mouth, while he's still saying, let me tell you how great I am, while he's speaking, a voice came from heaven and said, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you. And you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven years of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Verse 33, this is still the king looking backwards because he's past this now. It says, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now there's a whole lot of psychology that tries to read this story and figure it out. There's mental disorders. One's called zoanthropy, like zoo, you know the word. So this is when a person thinks of himself as an animal and acts like an animal. But then there's more specific ones. Lycanthropy is when you think you're a wolf. This is how the werewolf movies developed. Then there's boanthropy, where you think you're a cow or an ox. These are legitimate mental disorders. They're psychological diseases that are even present in people's life today. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar experienced because of his refusal to repent. So for seven years, they had to hide away this leader for seven years, you had to make sure nobody knew how sick he was. For seven years, you had to make sure nobody realized that the king wasn't ruling the kingdom. They had to hide him. They had to make sure no one tried to revolt or have a coup against him. You can imagine Daniel was involved in running the government for these seven years. See, we're reading Daniel 4. Next week we'll read Daniel 5. But there is a quote I want to show you from Daniel 5. This is what Daniel would say about the king when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly. He was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. Until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind. So we're back to Daniel 4, 
coming toward the end of this chapter, toward the end of his official proclamation, the king says, Daniel 4, 34, but at the end of that period, at the end of seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. That's prayer, of course. And my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion. God's kingdom is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. So after seven years, he has what we would call a spiritual awakening. His eyes are opened, and he looks up. Because what have we said already? God is a merciful God. Psalm 18, we'll just put these on the screen quickly, talks about that. Psalm 103, the bottom of the screen, the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. So Nebuchadnezzar said, this is what I experienced for seven years, an official proclamation he's declaring this. And in verse 35, he says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he, that's the God of Israel, does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, after seven years, at that time my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. My counselors and my nobles began seeking me out, so I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are true and his ways are just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. And again, all over your Bible we're called to humble ourselves. Isaiah 29, shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? Isaiah 45, woe to the one who quarrels with his maker. Romans 9, the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? So, 35 years into his kingdom, he refuses to repent. He suffers this for seven years. Remember we told you, maybe you remember, he reigns for 43 years. Well, 35 plus 7, that would be 42. So, he gets one more year, it appears, restored to his kingship. Now, I want to ask a few questions, but first let's do what we do at the end of each chapter and see what lessons we should get from this chapter. Lessons from Daniel chapter 4, you see the screen. Number one, every person is tempted to revel in their own strengths or accomplishments. God deserves our humility and he desires our humility. Pride in self will be punished spiritually. Number four, God is a righteous judge who offers the opportunity for repentance and restoration. God the creator is sovereign over all of his creation. And God, like he did for Daniel, gives wisdom to his faithful followers. But as we finish up, let's ask a few questions. Why did Nebuchadnezzar waver so much? Why the spiritual roller coaster in his life? Well, Jesus said to a guy named Nicodemus, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. See, I think the difference in Nebuchadnezzar's life is he was informed about God. But the question is, was he a new creation in God? I've said it to you this way over the years. Jesus is calling us to be his followers, not his fans. Why did he waver? Because information about God is not life-changing. It might be interesting. It's not life-changing. So the big question people ask as they study the book of Daniel, for centuries people have asked, 
Was Nebuchadnezzar a true believer? First answer, there's no way we know what any other person's heart is. Surely no way we know from 2,600 years. So when you debate the topic, was he a true believer? Some say yes, because of this testimony he gave. This official proclamation telling everybody in his kingdom, I was so proud of myself, God humbled me, and now I call on you to believe in the one true God. Some say yes. Some say no. Most people agree we can't judge another person's heart. Was Nebuchadnezzar a true believer? I can't answer that for you. So the final question we have to ask today is, am I a true believer? Because just like Nebuchadnezzar wavered, sometimes he worshiped God and sometimes he rejected God. And then he would go back and forth on this roller coaster. Many of us have lived that kind of life. Some of us in this stage of our days are living that. Today I feel like I'm close to God, but next week I'm going to reject him and and my ego and my pride build me up. And and when I get built up, there's no room for God in my life. And and the roller coaster continues. So the question people ask is, was Nebuchadnezzar a true believer? And we can't answer that one. But the biggest question is, am I a true believer? What does it mean to be a true believer? The Apostle Paul, Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. See, Jesus is not another historical figure. Daniel is. Nebuchadnezzar is. They're very, very important historical figures. And some people put Jesus in the same category. Abraham Lincoln... Buddha, Mohammed, Nebuchadnezzar, Napoleon, Alexander the Great. You put the list of the big shots in the world up there. And that's an interesting list. But when you put Jesus in that list, you've missed who Jesus is. Because he's not a big shot of the history books. He's the savior of the world. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. He's not a big shot. He's not an important historical figure. He's Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Why does that matter? Because all of those people that I just mentioned are very interesting and very important. And every one of them died and stayed dead. But there's one who died and then he rose back to life. That's what makes him different. So the biggest question of the book of Daniel is not, was Nebuchadnezzar a true believer? The biggest question of the book of Daniel is, am I a true believer? That Jesus is not one of the important figures in the textbook. Like our education system presents him. But he is Lord. That's the question we have to ask. Am I a true believer? That's Daniel 4. Daniel 5 is next week. Let's pray about it. As we bow our heads and hearts, I'm going to ask some of the folks from our prayer ministry to come to the front of the stage here. Dear God, we ask you to deliver us from that sin of pride to deliver us from the sin of self-contentment and self-promotion. We're all tempted to look at our own successes and claim that it's because we are that important. And when we do that, we reject you as the one true God. So Father, I pray that each of us will ask the question, am I a true believer? Have I bowed my heart to the one king of the universe, greater than any emperor and ruler who ever lived, King Jesus? 
And God, we pray for leaders around the world, leaders in our own country, that they will bow their hearts to the one true king whose name is Jesus. Because we do not need the power of this world. We do not need the power of a military. We need the power of the God of the universe to change hearts. And may we leave this place today saying, I am a true believer because Jesus is my king. And this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. As you go, you'll see there's folks here ready to pray with you if you'd like. We have our small groups about to meet. We have our prayer room right outside this door. We'll see you on the next.